I'm Dr. Brian Moran from the Chicago Prostate Cancer Center here in Chicago. Uh, thank you, David Crawford, for inviting me to this meeting. I wish to God I could be there in person, but I cannot, so you're going to have to listen to me. I have no conflicts of interest. So, you know, there's been numerous arguments over the years regarding the efficacy of brachytherapy, whether LDR or HDR, and it, suffice it to say the debate is over. It works uh, brilliantly, and we need to move on to more innovative um, aspects of the t technique of brachytherapy, and that's what I'm going to focus on. I, I will give an overview of it. So, you know, in my opinion, brachytherapy, again, whether LDR or seed implant, um, HDR, they're definitely a disruptive innovator, exactly with the technology we have today. So we have entered a new era of improved diagnostics with MR fusion biopsy, transperineal mapping biopsy, and now genomic analysis. We're better able to understand exactly what type of cancer we're dealing with. And, you know, that presents us with a spectrum of disease. And if you look on the left side, you see low risk disease, low volume. You can see low risk disease, high volume. However, you can go all the way to the other side and see high risk disease, high volume. And only then, once you understand where you are, can you apply the appropriate treatment. This is the American Brachytherapy Society guidelines for the various treatment groups. And you can see that, um, obviously, Androgen deprivation is not really favored in low-risk patients. It's optional in intermediate-risk patients, yet not mandatory. And in high-risk patients, there clearly is a demonstrated benefit. Brachytherapy outcomes clearly, clearly are operator-dependent, probably more so with LDR seed implants than HDR. And the reason for that is that with HDR brachytherapy, it allows one to dose optimize, meaning once the catheters are in place, the physicist can adjust the dwell time of the radioactive source, thereby distributing the radiation uh, to the desired volume. Whereas with LDR, once you put those seeds in, you're, you know, you're destined to live with uh, the dosimetry that you created. Unfortunately, despite the virtues of brachytherapy, there's been a, a massive decline in the last decade using brachytherapy, and there's various reasons for this. One is obviously the advent of robotic surgery, the uh, escalation of the use of external beam, whether it's IMRT or proton therapy, and unfortunately, most of the training programs around the country do not have active brachytherapy volumes, enough to teach um, patients, or enough to teach residents. Yet, Brachytherapy is a tenacious survivor. Patients want it. It's a single treatment versus nine weeks of external beam radiation or undergoing surgery. Former patients, in our experience, are encouraging new patients to come for consultation. And um, I think we've achieved excellent outcomes while maintaining quality of life, and this uh, further propagates the referral pattern. So approximately 85 to 90 percent of my patients are, are referred to as self-referred, meaning they, they came to us from without a, uh, a referring physician. The difference between LDR and HDR, LDR seed implants, a single outpatient procedure using a millicurie source, which is a very low energy source, whereas high dose rate brachytherapy, usually also done as an outpatient procedure, requires one to two fractions or one to two treatments and the source of radiation in that technology is a 10 Curie source, a much more radioactive material, uh, delivering higher energy or thus higher dose rate. So we were upon a revolution, uh, the precise location of malignancy within the prostate. We should be able to target that therapy to that location. And um, I think Mark Emberton should be given a great amount of credit for his comment it's transition from not knowing where the tumor is to knowing where the tumor is. And this is a nice book that he and Ashima Med, along with Peter Carroll, had published, and I encourage you all to get a copy of it. Traditional, you know, this is the standard of care, really, for biopsy of the prostate around the country, at least in the U.S. Um, transrectal approach uh, really does not allow one to adequately sample the anterior aspect of the prostate especially the anterior apex. 
So that's simply a matter of mechanics because of where the rectum is and the ability to bend the needle, so to speak, which would be very difficult to do. Yet with, with a transperineal, we call this stereotactic transperineal prostate biopsy because we're using all three axes, the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis, and we're able to map where each specimen was obtained from. And I'm delighted to see that there are more and more people around the country performing this type of biopsy. This is an example of a focal brachytherapy. You can see on the left side of the screen that is where the seeds are and that is where the tumor was uh, identified on a mapping biopsy, whereas the rest of the prostate had a negative biopsy. So in summary, transperineal template biopsy is very comprehensive. The, the mapping is sub sophisticated. It's not a cognitive thing at all. It's very objective. E. coli sepsis essentially zero. It's painless. We do it under anesthesia, although uh, some people are now doing it under local anesthesia and and getting good samples. But under general anesthesia, you can you can essentially map every five millimeters. It gives one great confidence in assessing the tumor burden, and it definitely, if you're doing brachytherapy, allows for a much more sophisticated treatment plan. These are examples. Um, of a, a study group where they got together and discussed the various focal concepts. But I've done a lot of this and I can assure you that anything below hemigland ablation is very, would be very difficult to do with today's uh, current technology. So who are candidates for focal therapy? I would say low risk, low volume disease, intermediate risk, low volume disease, High risk disease, we've done those, provided they have low volume disease that was accurately identified as to its location. And I think, you know, we started exploring this concept over 15 years ago. We have 15 year follow up, and uh, the results are astonishingly positive. And I do think that we have to keep up with our diagnostic abilities and, and think out of the box a little bit more. So the big, the big argument or criticism would be how do you assess outcomes and success rates and, you know, logically if you have a, a certain volume and the initial PSAs a, a certain number, the percentage of volume of the prostate that's treated should be proportional to the decrease in the pretreatment PSA and we call that an impact PSA. And um, the data has, has really kind of followed that and we're soon to publish on that. This is an example of our focal series overall, about 150 patients looking at PSA declines, and that's the overall graph and, and the treatment time since, the time since treatment with the overall reduction of 25 to 50% of the gland being treated, and you can clearly see that the PSA reduction, in fact, is, is larger than that, and, and our average was 60% reduction in PSA of the pretreatment PSAs overall. Why do focal therapy? Theoretically, it makes sense, especially with low volume, low risk disease. Is it a compromise between active surveillance versus radical prostatectomy or total gland ablation, whether with brachytherapy or IMRT? And I, I don't I I think that there this is what patients find attractive. The goal obviously is equal disease eradication provided less morbidity, lower cost, one could argue, but the salvage options are, it would be like treating a de novo cancer that's just been untouched, and um, you can literally do anything to these patients if, if, it's, if it's required. But patients are asking for it, and I think we, we need to be familiar with it. How do you define a recurrence? Well, I would say that it depends where the cancer was identified. If the cancer was identified from the treated portion of the prostate, then yes, I would say that's a failure. If the biopsy was retrieved from the untreated portion of the gland, then you're dealing with an entirely separate cancer. And um, we have, on rare occasion, identified contralateral cancers in an untreated prostate, and these we approach by just completing the implant to that side of the prostate. You also could offer that patient IMRT or surgery. Fortunately, we haven't had enough failures to have 
experience with the salvage options. I want to thank everybody. Um, I wish I could be there, but that really is contemporary Reiki therapy at this point in time. And I, I could go into numerous charts and data sets, but I think the point of this talk, well, how brief it was, was just to give you an overview of, of what's going on out there in the field of innovation. Um, so I hope you have a great meeting and thank you again.